The next important interest rate risk category is basis risk. Basis risk appears when instruments refer to different types of rates. For example, as already announced, a loan which are priced on the prime rate but founded by liability which is indexed to the market rate, like for example, Uribor or LIBOR. So there is this differential because the base rate on the asset side moves only by the discrete amounts. Meanwhile, the market rates moves. Obviously, can drift substantially, uh, fluctuate over time. So here we can see how it uh, arises. For example, on the asset side, we have three types of items. We have the liquid asset buffer. In this case, in this example, the main risk factors of this portfolio is the base rate. Then we have the portfolio of the customer loans, which are indexed to three month LIBOR. And so the risk factor is the three months LIBOR. And then let's imagine that we have the fixed rate assets, like mortgages, for example, which do not, uh, the rate is not moving over time, but is fixed over the certain period. Uh, instead, on the liability side, we have, for example, the customer notice deposit and the, this portion, the risk factor is three months LIBOR. Uh, we have the customer deposit, which are administered rate products, so the bank can adjust the rate at their leisure uh, according to the willingness of the senior management. And then we have the fixed rate liabilities. Those fixed rate liabilities can be, for example, the uh, fixed rate bond, which is funding the asset side. And here we can clearly see the differential in terms of the movement. So we are definitely exposed to the base rate LIBOR free month because it's arising from the liquid asset buffer, the difference in the risk factor between the liquid asset buffer and the customer notice deposits. And then administered rate products to free month LIBOR because the administered rate products are founded the three month LIBOR. And there is this time lag, which I was uh, referring to um, before, which is important and which may, it's for sure we cannot adjust it immediately at the same time as market moves. The next uh, um, important, maybe one of the most important risk categories is the yield risk. This is particularly important when the bank has uh, the longer duration on asset side or is taking the uh, longer duration on the, of the banking book. Uh, this is, um, for example, the case when banks has the mortgage, fixed rate mortgages or fixed rate asset uh, treasury bonds, for example, and they are founded by the floating or shorter term repricing liabilities. So as I said, um, beyond 12 months, there is definitely uh, the difference in the movements between the risk different tenors on the interest rate curve. So, for example, if imagine look at this uh, this graph, and uh, if there is the un unanticipated non-parallel shift of the yield curve, so uh, for example, the the curve is steepening or flattening, or is going to be inverted, uh, or sometimes you can see the short up scenario, short down. So there is definitely some adjustment which needs to be needed, needs to be done in terms of the hedging strategy uh, in order to. Um, not take excessive position on the EVE side. So again, here the risk which is uh, the bank is exposed to is uh, EVE volatility, so economic value of equity volatility. And this is why the regulator is asking to, um, to monitor uh, the EVE under the six regulatory scenario. This is short up, show down, parallel up, parallel down, uh, steepener, a flattener. So those four, which are not parallel, 
are exactly meant to uh, to measure the exposure to the yield risk and are especially important uh, if the portfolio, if the bank has a longer duration portfolio. And um, you can see that if the, um, the, the yield curve shifts, uh, the price, for example, of the bond, which was initially priced on the, on the time one, time zero, sorry, uh, initial yield curve will change in price. So uh, the, the different movements of these rates after the shock uh, of this tenor can um, expose the bank to PV01 in terms of uh, PV01. So there is time bucket sensitivity itself and there is also the EVE volatility. So those two risk categories, uh, which are the, the metrics which are measure this kind of risk. So as I said, from the static risk, we will be talking about the metrics uh, very soon. But just now, I will tell you that there are at least two metrics from the regulatory perspective. Regulator is requiring uh, economic value of equity volatility in order to assess this risk category. But there is also very important metrics, which is measuring the time bucket sensitivity or exposure to the different uh, particular tenors, uh, also overall PV01. PV01, I will be talking about it in a quite detailed manner, is um, the shift uh, of the interest rate curve by one basis point up or down. It can be, it can be down or up or down. Um, it is particularly important because there is very small um, uh, increase of the yield curve only by one basis point, but you already see how much uh, if we shock bef uh, after shock. If you see the the, the PV zero one after shock, so with the PV with one basis point increase or decrease, and compare it to the total value and the on and the base scenario, so without application of uh, shift by one basis point, you already see how sensitive is the uh, the bank under certain time buckets and overall position. So you can adjust it through hedging. You can also drill down to understand what is exactly the tenor of your banking book which drives this exposure. There is also as I already said, optionality risk, and here I would like to uh, to talk uh, a bit more in detail about those two. So we have definitely the prepayment risk, which is very important risk, especially when you have the mortgages portfolio. So as I said, this is the risk of a, of incurring loss due to uh, increased um, prepayment driven by the uh, changes in the rates. So if, for example, you have the certain uh, prepayment rate, you calculated the certain prepayment rate for your mortgage portfolio and you hedged based on this prepayment rate. So, for example, you assume that your mortgage portfolio have 7%, has 7% of prepayment on the base scenario um, and on the, um, in T0, then um, if the rates moves and if they are moving uh, highly up, then you will be expecting the slowdown in the prepayment. So it means that there will be lower prepayment. And this is typical phenomena known like financial prepayment. So if the rates are going up, the prepayment tends to slow down and to decrease. And vice versa, if you have the... Uh, the uh, decrease in the rates, so you are expecting to see the higher prepayment rate. This is because the client will be searching, will be shopping for the uh, new rate and lower rate products in order to pay lower rates on mortgage or, or, or the loan. And uh, the bank has to protect itself. So first of all, 
imagine that you are making the hedging strategy based on this exactly this strategy so you are assessing that your prepayment based prepayment rate is seven percent then uh, the rates are moving up and the mm, uh, the prepayment is um, going down uh so for example it decreased to six percent from seven percent to six percent right so in this case you uh you have um your mortgage will be having a longer uh longer duration because there is lower prepayment rate so the duration of mortgage portfolio will be lengthening and it means that you will need more hedges, more hedges because you want to, there will be slightly an open hedge position, uh, which uh, the, uh, open interest rate risk position, which needs to be hedged because the duration, the average duration of your mortgage portfolio is increasing, is lengthening. So this is, um, uh, this is very important that you will be under hedged in this case. In the contrary, when the prepayment rates are going up because the rates are going down, then you have the just the opposite uh, outcome because your portfolio <clears throat> will be shortening duration, will be, you will be facing shorter duration, and then you have uh, hedged the, prepare, the uh, mortgage portfolio based on the 7% uh, prepayment estimation rate, and then you will find out, find out that your prepayment rate is 11, for example. So you will be uh, overhatched in this position and you will be needing to unwind, you will need to unwind the certain swap positions which will be unwind at losses. So uh, in this case there will be a PNL impact and um, it is uh, important how to estimate the the first estimation of the prepayment rate is ex extremely important because there are two factors which are coming into the picture. There is never only one factor. So the first factor is this, uh, the model which you need to create uh, on for financial prepayment, which is the relationship between the prepayment rate and the interest rate uh, movements. So how uh, much they are correlated. Obviously, there are some other characteristics which impact this, uh, which are coming into the picture, uh, which impact the model, financial model for prepayment. For example, we know that uh, the different um, segments of clients uh, has, a, has an impact. Uh, for example, we know that the age of the customer, we know that the geographical location for the customer, uh, uh, we know also that sometimes the currency has an impact and also there is another factor it is the age of the loan itself. So if the seniority of the loan, so if the, uh, the loan is, um, for example, immediately uh, you have the loan which is one year old, mortgage which is one year old, obviously you will be less um, encouraged to prepay this uh, um, this loan because you just uh, uh, you know went through the through the process of uh, set, uh, of having the mortgage of drawing down the mortgage so you 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 it is new for you you've just signed up, up the contract so now you will be quite resistant in order to prepay it and then come into another deal. But uh, obviously, there is if the rationale is uh, um, important for you, the economic in encouragement is important for you. So you will gain in terms of in economical uh, terms, then you will do it. And uh, this is, uh, however, important variable independent variable which is driving the uh, modeling of financial prepayment. The, another thing, we are structural prepayment. So as I said, you have those two 
models which needs to be done for the prepayments. You have the financial prepayments, you have the with the independent variables, or as from the mathematical perspective, you, you call it uh, independent variable or explanatory variable. And then you have also the structural prepayment. Structural prepayment is nothing else like uh, factors which impact the behavior but are not related to, um, to the macroeconomic factors like, for example, uh, interest rates. It is instead driven by the in a certain situation of your client, for example, they are moving, changing job, uh, they are um, uh, facing divorce or inherited some money, and they want to prepare uh, the mortgage in advance because of those reasons. So there is no increase in rates, there is no any changes, um, no changes in the financial circumstances but this is nothing else like uh, the, um, the need of the client personal need of the client to uh, to early redeem the mortgage and this is known as structural prepayment or statistical prepayment and usually uh, they are assessed um, for the different product categories uh, again um, if it's for example uh, the um, uh, revolving uh, line loan, uh, you assess it. If it's mortgage, you assess it. If this is the consumer loan, uh, credit card. So you are basically making the analysis on the based on the historical data in this case. So this is the model which assess uh, your portfolio. You are doing this model based on the what happened in the past and you assume that this rate will be useful Mm, uh, for the estimation of the overall prepayment rate for your for your banking book and for every single portfolio. So the total prepayment uh, estimation will be the sum of three factors. The first is financial prepayment, the second one a statistical prepayment, and finally we have the expert judgment. And the expert judgment is something we um, we need not to underestimate because it's something which our senior management, which is the uh, which knows the bank, which knows the client, which has extensive experience, banking experience, and they uh, calibrate this rate according to their experience, to they, you know, sometimes you can say that they have um, you know, they view on the how the market is moving. And this is all factors which will impact the total number. Based on this total number, you will be hedging. You will be performing your hedging strategy. And this hedging strategy will be entering into the um, uh, payer swaps uh, in order to close the, um, the open gap uh, position. And uh, you will try to um, obviously convert, transform those fixed rate assets into the floating rate assets. So you will be hedged against, um, you will be hedged because you will be obviously on the liability side, you probably uh, have more floating liabilities. So then uh, you will close the exposure. And there is another kind of the risk, which is pipeline risk. Pipeline risk is something which is very important as well. And this is, again, the behavioral optionality, which is included into the portfolio. So this is the difference in the period. This is the period or difference between the agreement of the mortgage product rate between the bank and the client and then effective drawdown of the balance of the mortgage. So uh, there is the, um, there can be some movement, unexpected movement of the interest rates between this period, because sometimes those periods are even three months or even six months. So uh, 
you you will face some exposure because if uh, the rates uh, go up and you set up the lower rates with the client, uh, obviously the in the um, probability that he will draw down the total balance is higher than if uh, the rates uh, move just in the opposite direction. So you you know that the um, the bank is uh, hedging. Uh, based on the um, estimation of the expected volumes. Instead, those ex expected volumes are, uh, again, the mix between the model, uh, which is uh, using the um, statistical approach and past experience and different explanatory variable plus the management overlayer. So there is the judgment of your senior management, which is the most important factor coming to the picture. And um, overall, we'll tell you what should be, which percentage you want to hedge uh, of those balances you want to hedge right now. And uh, there is uh, obviously the model risk involved because, um, you know, if the, this assumption is incorrect or is uh, too, uh, you know, conservative, so you will hedge more or uh, the opposite, you will hedge less, then it will have a huge impact on PL because the, the hedging is expensive. It is not for free. So uh, the, the customer, uh, for example, um, ch take up. Uh, the mortgage um, more uh, voluntarily if the rates have a reason or if they fallen they will be uh, less likely to draw down because here obviously imagine if the rates go up and you uh, agreed with your client the lower rate seven percent for example and now the rates at eleven percent so obviously the client is interested to have a loan at seven percent instead of the new rate which is eleven so he will definitely uh, draw down this loan instead the opposite if for example he stopped at seven percent and now the rates are four he will take i don't want the loan at seven percent i want the new loan at four percent so he won't draw down the old loan at seven percent instead he will try to renegotiate or he will go to another bank so this is particularly important <clears throat> for the revolving lines for example when you are doing the uh, estimation of the revolving line so which uh, what will be the drawdown of this uh, of these balances which uh, balances will move forward which not and um, this is something which uh, which has to be assessed and now let's talk a more a bit more det in detail about the metrics so we now understood that there are four different interest rate risk categories and, uh, and now we would like to talk about the metrics. Uh, metrics uh, which uh, measure the exposure to those uh, types of risk and you, we can see <clears throat> already that we have two different measures. So we have the economic value measures which I said are uh, measuring the long-term value impacts. So here we are talking about <clears throat> economic value of equity or duration gap or PV01. So all metrics which are measuring <clears throat> the, uh, which have the um, uh, objective variable economic value. So economic value is objective variable in this case. Meanwhile, the second category of models measure the short-term impact, short-term income impact, as I said. So it is usually up to 12 months. And those are known as earnings metrics or net interest income sensitivity, and those metrics has the objective variable impact on income. So there is the income volatility. 
or sometimes you can hear more uh, margin volatility. And uh, those two groups, first of all, we need to start with those two groups and they divide in uh, static and dynamic models. So when we talk about the static model, we are the models, we are talking about the models which assume uh, like for like in terms for of NII sensitivity. So like for like means that you will replace all expiring or uh, repricing items with the items of the same uh, with the same financial characteristics. So, for example, if you have the bond which expires within the one month time period, so you know that if you want to reinvest it, you will need to do it with the same kind of financial characteristic until the end of the gapping period. And then uh, the curve, interest rate curve. The interest rate curve is definitely all it is. You use the forward rate interest rate curve. Uh, sometimes, but uh, now not anymore, probably you, um, you don't uh, even do forward rate, but you assume the spot rate as it is now and you project it for the future. Uh, for the future period. Uh, now you do with the forward rate, the static models use the forward rate. Um, or you can use some historical scenarios based on the historical movements of the curve scenario, uh, shocks, applying the historical shocks. But uh, those scenarios obviously are, you know, like you you know them from from now you know how they evolve they are not a result of the um, Monte Carlo simulation or any statistical dynamical um, econometric model so it is important that it is the picture overall picture of your banking book as it is today it's the cut off date and you assume for the sake of NII sensitivity analysis that it will be like for like instead for the EVE it will be uh, until the end of or will be runoff so you are saying runoff scenario so all um, the mortgages will uh, you know, well, you assume that they will die, let's say die um, at the time of the expiration date so the life of your banking book is uh, following the life of um, you know of all the items which you have today. Uh, you don't assume any new business production. You don't assume on the static views and then simulations or evolutions in terms of the interest rate curve. So it is very important. You don't do any simulations for the interest rate curve. All mm, you do is the assessment of the situation as it is today for now. Instead, for the dynamic models, you will be simulating the curve. You will be simulating the composition, the new composition of the banking book. So there will be some new business strategy, uh, funding strategy. Sometimes it will reflect the, uh, the corporate plan. Sometimes you will do um, just, uh, you know, the statistical or uh, Monte Carlo simulation will be going with the different uh, scenarios and you will elaborate it like thousands of different scenarios and you will take the, uh, the worst scenario or, or one of the worst scenarios in order to assess. So this is something which is known dynamic models against the static models. Now you will ask me, which one is the best practice? Um, the answer is not so easy because um, the static methods have uh, quite important advantages. Uh, first of all, for the smaller or medium-sized institutions, uh, they are must-to-have. And why? Because they're easy to understand 
and we will be analyzing uh, the position to interest rate risk according the static models. So you will see how easy the analysis is if you know uh, for what to look, in, to look for, you will see exactly that it's uh, quite easy to predict what is to, ass to assess if the situation of the bank is okay or not. And uh, it is also uh, quite easy to calculate very fast. So if you want to do mm, some very, very mm, fast analysis uh, in order to provide uh, your senior management with an answer, you can, for example, NIS sensitivity calculated with the static models can be done on by hand. So you will do it immediately. And uh, this is the advantage of these models. Instead, you have to remember that there are some disadvantages also. I'm not promoting only the static models, uh, even though the regulator is uh, still requiring uh, some analysis performed by the static metrics. So uh, it is not uh, abundant in the new regulatory landscape. So you have to use them. But uh, dynamic models gives you some uh, uh, additional information because you can simulate the interest rate curve. You can elaborate your own scenarios. You can um, elaborate the composition of the banking book. So uh, this gives you enormous advantage. Uh, for example, some, someone can ask you what will be our... Um, uh, interest rate risk on the medium long part of the structural risk exposure if we take on additional uh, 500 million of mortgages and if we assume that it will be funded 5% by this, by uh, short-term funding, 10% by, um, um, for example, CASA and so on and so forth. So those simulations, you will need to have a bit uh, more sophisticated uh, simulation module in order to, to do it. Um, there is important, important point which I would like to underline here. So interest rate risk has two forms. It is economic value volatility and earnings volatility, those two metrics are complementary in nature. And when we are saying complementary in, in nature, what do I mean? So uh, it means that um, if you, um, there is significant negative correlation between them. So reduction in one metrics usually leads, not always, usually leads to increase in the other. So they are quite negatively correlated. So if you are, let's, let's say it in a very simple way, if one is okay and you are doing well under NII sensitivity, it does not mean that you will be doing well under EVE uh, volatility. So you need to monitor those two metrics in order to have the overall picture of, um, of IRBB or at least of certain risk categories of IRBB. So uh, this is important information. And for example, if you model the non-maturating uh, deposit, will be there will be the separate webinar on non-maturating uh, deposit modeling, you will notice that the earning approach will tend to drive those a free reserve and non-interest bearing current accounts longer and uh, smoothen the earnings metrics, so the earnings uh, volatility, sorry, but increase the duration, obviously, because if you, are, uh, if you are putting them longer, so of course you will, uh, let's say, smoothen the uh, margin volatility but you will gain some uh, duration, so exposure from the medium-long part of the, of the curve. So it is important to have an other way around. If you model them too short, you will have the, uh, you will not stabilize your earnings. So your earnings will be not stable 
because you are modeling them up to, for example, 12 months. So then you will have these gaps which are repricing frequently and which are uh, moving frequently and you will be exposed to the NII volatility. Uh, instead, you don't see them over 12 month time as a gap and uh, therefore you, you, you don't have um, uh, impact on the EVE. It doesn't mean that you, you know, you don't have the EVE risk. So the trade-off between the NIA sensitivity and EVE volatility is important because you, um, there are two opposite, they're working in two opposite directions. So be careful once when you model the non-maturating deposit. And um, we have also, um, at, let me, let me uh, summarize those metrics. So uh, we have from the earnings perspective, NII simulation. So uh, we are simulating, uh, for example, under the parallel shift 200 basis point or uh, 100 basis point. We can do even uh, the NII uh, under steepener, flattener, or to see on the forecasted, under forecasted scenario, what will be the impact. Uh, in 2018, we have, um, in 2017, we had the stress test for the banks, for the European banks, and um, they uh, required, the regulator required uh, the certain set of the shocks uh, to be applied in order to calculate the IRBB metrics. In 2018, uh, we had the overall market stress test, wide, wide stress test scenario. And uh, this wide stress test scenario had Im embedded some shocks, uh, the movements to the interest rate uh, for different currencies. So uh, it was the simulation. It was exactly to simulate the, mo the movement of the NII, the regulator wanted to see how the NII of banks will be impacted under different um, shocks, under different uh, interest rate movements. So uh, the NII simulation is probably uh, one of the most important metrics for NII because you will be positioning, you will be making the uh, position in terms of gaps uh, in order to um, minimize the volatility of NII to e and to, uh, increase the profitability. So it's very important. Uh, some system, sometimes the system does this, uh, the ILM system, or sometimes the banks uh, has their own model, which is um, coded in Python or uh, in Visual Basic, and you are calculating um, those simulations. Um, you have the different simulations. And then you have the gap analysis, which is uh, quite simple metrics, uh, very, very um, simple, but I like it very much. So the gap analysis is showing you the comparison between the asset and liability repricing cash flows. So uh, the residual gap, you always think in terms of residual gaps. And gap equals risk sensitive asset minus risk sensitive liabilities. Risk sensitive assets are all assets which are sensitive to the movement of the interest rate curve. And then you have the um, interest rate uh, rate sensitive liabilities again, all liabilities which are sensitive to the movements of the yield curve. And the, uh, by the different time bucket, you divide your banking book in the different time bucket and you make the difference in terms of outstanding asset minus liabilities and you see the residual gap. And this residual gap, or positive or negative, arise you an exposure 
to a repricing risk or yield risk. So you need to have the uh, gap analysis, the, the technical term for the gap analysis is the repricing gap. Repricing gap analysis is the fundam fundamental tool required by the regulator in the new final report on IRBB. And um, it's very, very useful for banks to see it in uh, if you want to make decision uh, what should be your IRBB strategy, which uh, characteristics of products, uh, what characteristic of products should be in order to, <clears throat> to follow your IRBB strategy, you must have the gap repricing gap analysis at, in place. And uh, um, the next uh, metric is uh, or static or dynamic. So if dynamic, you call it earnings at risk. If static, you call it NII sensitivity. And NII sensitivity, we'll be talking about the calculation in detail. The NII sensitivity will give you only the um, impact on NII uh, under current situation, how it is for your all banking book as it is now, as it is structured now, with uh, the interest rates which are right like today, and you assess uh, the um, the impact on a uh, net interest income. So after shock, two hundred basis point or minus two hundred or whatever shock you decide to apply. Um, then from the economic perspective, you will have, as I said, um, at least three. Uh, here you don't see the third metrics, which is important, but there are some discussions and argument uh, regarding uh, if the third metric, which I'm going to tell you about, is appropriate to the whole banking book. Uh, because it is VAR, value at risk. So sometimes, mm, you know, value at risk is, uh, is fantastic metrics, which is used for the trading book and under shorter term horizons. Here you are a long term horizon for the whole banking book. And sometimes you can hear, you know, uh, how, uh, what is the meaningness of this, uh, of this metric and uh, application of these metrics for the whole banking book. But this is, um, this is uh, another story. And then we have the economic value of equity. When you are discounting the cash flows on the asset side and liability side or the residual gap, uh, residual gap uh, if you are going with the simple method, static method, then you are discounting the residual gap. Uh, by time bucket and coming up with the one number which is the economic value of, of the banking book. And then if you are shocking the curve, you are shocking uh, your interest rate curve by, you know, by the specific shock for every time bucket you are coming up with different scenario, then you will come up with the EVE sensitivity. So you will say this is the difference between the shocked and non-shocked scenario. So please remember that delta EVE or delta NII or NII sensitivity, EVE volatility is the difference between the shocked and non-shocked scenario. So it will show you how sensitive is your banking book to the movements in the interest rate curve. So it always thinks in terms of the difference. So what it does not do, it does not uh, provide you with, uh, you know, uh, with the calculation, the full evaluation of all the um, asset and liabilities. Um, um, and then uh, the, you don't calculate the total economic value of uh, with you calculate just the difference for the IRBB purposes. You don't calculate the whole 
economic value of the every single items. So the, the, the metric which is important for IRBB is the difference between shocked and non-shocked scenario. Then you have the sensitivity analysis, which is uh, PV01, sometimes you can hear DV01. So it is parallel shift of one basis point in rates and uh, sometimes for different as I said, the different shocks. Uh, we call it also time bucket sensitivity because it's a very good metrics to assess the sensitivity of different time buckets and to understand the key rate exposure for the bank. When I'm saying the key rate, I mean what is the tenor to which our bank is the most sensitive to. And this exactly helps us to understand. We will see it in detail a bit later. It is important that right now we have this concept very, uh, very well consolidated. So time bucket sensitivity, please remember it is something which will tell you about their exposure to the structural interest rate risk. So it is usually used for the medium long part of the curve and the fixed rate items which rise you the exposure to the um, to the um, uh, to the structural interest rate risk then uh, we uh, will be talking about um, sorry i need to go down Oh, here it goes, sorry, apologies. We have here some metrics uh, summarized. So we can see um, the target metrics for IRBB. So we have, again, the interest rate, uh, rate sensitivity analysis, NII sensitivity, which is the uh, hypothetical changes in NII for 12 or 24 months. For, ver uh, for various parallel shifts in interest, for example, 50, 100, 200 basis point, and regulator come up with different shifts for different currencies. So every currency has its own uh, shift, um, uh, which is uh, allocated to this currency, uh, corresponding shift. And then we have the stressed scenario analysis, which is uh, analysis of our uh, changes in NII, hypothetical changes in NII for 12 or 24 months for hypothetical or historical stress events. For example, 208 or 209 credit crunch. Uh, we have 1994 rate hikes, which is important stress scenario for the treasury portfolios because it's something which impacted exactly the, the bonds, this crisis, the bonds product. And then we have the interest rate sensitivity analysis, which is for EVE. So the same which is done for the first metric will be done for the, to the second metric. So you will be analyzing parallel and non-parallel shifts. So yield risk plus mm, parallel EVE and the parallel scenario. And this is exactly what regulator is asking for. They're asking for six regulatory scenario. And we have DV01 also in this family. Uh, DV01 change in value of a position for a one basis point parallel shift in interest rates. Uh, we have uh, curve DV01, so as I said, or time bucket sensitivity, which looks at DV01 across each point, so the tenor of our banking book. Um, we have also um, stress scenario analysis for EVE and uh, we will be here analyzing hypothetical changes in EVE for various hypothetical and historical stress events. So now let's focus on the first one, uh, which I would like to show you the calculation of this metric uh, with the 
flow approach and stock approach, so two different mm, ways of calculation of this simple metric. Because why simple? Because we will be calculated with the 100 basis point parallel shock uh, under time horizon of 12 months, assuming that they will be like for like banking book. So we don't include any new business strategy. We don't simulate mm, any new composition. So everything uh, reply, uh, replace, uh, will be replaced with like us like for like. And um, well, let's see how we can calculate it. So traditional approach or repricing flows approach, uh, the NIA sensitivity is calculated with the traditional repricing gap methodology. So we need first to calculate, uh, to have our repricing gap. So to see by every single time bucket, the residual gap for whole banking book. Imagine as in this particular example, then this is split by quarters. So it is 12 months time horizon. And we have the first quarter, second, third and fourth. And we have asset which reprise uh, in the third quarter and liability which reprise in the second quarter, so at the end of the second quarter. And obviously this difference will be uh, driving the NII sensitivity, which do we need to calculate. We have three different elements into the equation. This is the equation for the NII sensitivity. So we calculate the shock multiplied by the gap multiplied by the time, uh, uh, the time factor. So the time factor is nothing else like the time left to the end of the gapping period. So the time left, the, so this is T, is the whole gapping period. In this case, capital T is 12 months. Meanwhile, the lowercase t is nothing else like the uh, time, uh, time to repricing. So in this case, we have the uh, two quarters. So we have the six months to repricing in the case of liability. So they will be uh, 0 0.5 years. Um, of um, difference between 12 months minus six months is six months. So here we have exactly six months. Meanwhile, here, the in, in the case of asset, the time, the time factor is 0 0.25 year. Uh, why? Because it is the difference between 12 months, so the gapping period, the whole gapping period, minus the time left to the gapping period, which is uh, three months. So it is obviously uh, 12 months uh, minus the uh, three quarters, so it's nine months, so it's three months, which is residual time left to the next repricing. This is how we need to uh, to think about this, um, uh, this factor, time factor. And uh, NIA sensitivity is the multiplication between the gap outstanding in terms of outstanding. So here we have 1000 multiplied by the mm, shift, which is the shock, for example, 200 basis point. In this case, we have 100 basis points, so 1% and multiplied by time factor. So here, the uh, asset gives you the NI sensitivity uh, of 2.5 because we have the repricing is 1000. The time factor is 0 0.25. The shock is 1%. So we have the NIA sensitivity coming from asset is 2.5. 
Meanwhile, from the liability, we have the outstanding of minus 1000 because it's liability multiplied by the time factor of 0 0.5 of six months and multiplied by 1%, which gives you minus five. And the sum of those NIA sensitivities, so the one which is coming from asset and the one which is coming from liability is minus 2.5. So what does it mean, this minus 2.5? Because it's uh, quite easy to calculate, but the most important thing is to understand what does it mean. So what is, what is the meaning of this number? Is it good for the bank or is it not good for the bank if we have minus 2.5? And do we need to do anything with this number? So first of all, um, we will be uh, having additional webinar on the shorter webinar on the uh, uh, reading the results of uh, of the um, of the metrics every single metric but here let me tell you you have the minus 2.5 definitely you are liability sensitive this is the first thing which you will tell to your alco on the short part of the curve our bank is liability sensitive, which means that we will be uh, incurring the losses if the rates move up on the short part of the curve. So under NII, uh, in terms of the net interest income, you will be hit negatively if the rates go up because you are liability sensitive. And this number tell you, exactly tells you this, that you, that you are liability sensitive, even though look that those two items have the same outstanding. This is 1000 for asset and 1000 of the liability. But the difference in repricing of those two items will give you the exposure to the repricing risk because the asset reprices after the liabilities or you can tell you in the can tell it in the different way the liability is uh, repricing faster than asset and in this case you will face the risk so the first risk date for the liability is closer to us and this is the first repricing date which is monitored under the NII metric so um, under flow approach you are uh, liability sensitive so this is ex usually um, approach which is monitored from the by the risk so risk perform those calculations because those calculations are required exactly by the regulator. So regulator gives you this equation to calculate the NII sensitivity. <clears throat> but if you want to hedge, you need to do slightly different analysis. And the analysis uh, for hedging or for... Um, uh, uh, ILM, so asset liability management operational ILM, which makes the, the hedging strategies, which uh, makes the um, profitability enhancement strategies, they need to see what is the bucket exposure, they need to calculate the bucket exposure. And then uh, they look at the stock. So this is the stock analysis, which is uh, also the repricing method, uh, but it's looking at the NIA sensitivity uh, calculated as the differential change in funding cost of unmatched position. So what does it mean? So you have the same situation like before. So there is the fixed rate asset, uh, which reprise after the third quarter, and you have the fixed rate liability, which reprised after six months. And um, now you will have this unbalance because the liability is fixed up to the end of the second quarter and asset is fixed uh, by the end of the third quarter. So there is the one quarter 
of difference and uh, you will you will look at this unbalance you will calculate it slightly differently because on the asset side what is the average unbalance there is no unbalance from the asset side so what is the hedging exposure for the asset until the third quarter there is no and what is the NIA sensitivity coming from asset? There is no. Instead, for the liability, you have the minus 1,000 um, position, which is unmatched. Uh, the hedging exposure is nothing else like um, bucket exposure. It is the same name, hedging exposure, bucket exposure. So it is outstanding multiplied by the duration of um, of the time uh, of this uh, timing of this unbalance so how long it is unbalanced so it is for the one quarter for three months right for three months so you have the hedging exposure of minus 250 and obviously uh, multiply the NIA sensitivity will be multiplication of the hedging exposure by shock. So the 1% multiplied by minus 250, which is the bucket exposure or hedging exposure. So the repricing stock approach will uh, allow to integrate with um, the IRBB analysis with balance sheet and NII simulation supporting yield enhancement strategies, right? So also the optimization of asset and liabilities in the medium long term. So this is why this analysis is so important.